Japan by River Cruise is made possible thanks to those who donate to the show at japanbyrivercruise.com and due to the generosity of our corporate sponsors. This week's show is brought to you by Umbrella Hats. Hey, remember us? We're the people who made those umbrella hats when we were all worried about spectators getting heat stroke at the Olympics. Well, we're still here, and we've got hundreds of thousands of colorful plastic umbrella hats just taking up space in a warehouse in Kanagawa. Sure, you all thought they were a dumb idea when we were talking about using them for the heat. But what about this rain, huh? Wouldn't you like to keep your head and only your head dry while you evacuate your flooded neighborhood in a rubber boat? Or add some color and some whimsy to your appearance on the national news when the rescue helicopter scoops you up in a rainbow-colored umbrella hat. They're functional, stylish, and cheap. And if you call in the next 30 minutes and mention the fact that mass-producing stupid plastic trash is part of what got us into this mess in the first place, we'll send you a second umbrella hat at no additional charge. That one says recycle on it. Also, please be patient if your call doesn't go through on the first try. As of right now, we can only afford one phone line, and we're also using it for our other business, trying to sell the Olympic Village cardboard beds to evacuation centers. Cardboard bed? No, I mean umbrella hats. Get yours now before we grind them up and feed them to sea life. Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Ollie Horn. And joining us this week is Dr. Wesley Cheek, special researcher at Ritsumeikan University, where he is a disaster. Oh, sorry, that says uh, he's, he is a disaster sociologist. He's also currently acting as an advisor for the government's initiative to repurpose riverboats as floating residences before the whole country ends up underwater. Wes, thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, th it always throws me off when people introduce me as doctor. I forget that I got that. On this week's show, historically unprecedented weather conditions in southwestern Japan are causing floods, landslides, and massive evacuations. Wes is either going to convince us that Japanese society is going to adapt to survive this, or we're all going to move to our backup countries. Plus, Ollie's got your weekly river cruise recommendation. Ollie? Yes, Bobby, this week's recommendation is the Climate Change Disaster Simulation River Cruise Experience and Education Centre in Odaiba, Tokyo, who has announced they will be taking a break next month after complaints that the financial, societal and ecological disasters they've been simulating aren't nearly as scary as the ones the customers confront on exiting the attraction. And the Tonogawa's river liners are once again experiencing departure delays after a series of dangerous incidents involving kappas. Cruise operators are responding by instituting a travel ban on not only kappas, but all members of any Greek organizations. We'll talk about whether or not this is an overreaction later, but first, Soap Talk. Uh, let's do a quick check-in with Brian. Yeah, Brian, how are you coping with the rain this week? Could we not this week? Right. Uh, Ollie, you had a bit of a dramatic week last week. Any updates for us? Yeah, so I managed to I managed to find out that I might have also got scammed. I think this guy's got my bank details, and so um, <laughs> update from last week is I'm missing some leg and some money, and um, all this kind of made me ill. The the only good thing about this whole thing is my show's been going really well. And it's partly been going well because I've been telling the story at the start of every show. <laughs> so, like, why I might have lost money uh, and uh, and a good chunk of time and leg um, as a result of what, what happened. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then listen to the show last week, please. I'm not going to repeat it again. It makes me sad when I repeat it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't have that, that first 10 minutes of the show, and now I do. So, um, But what, what I'm finding is I've got to tell the story right, because audiences either feel really, really sorry for me and think that I shouldn't be there, uh, or they find it really, 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 like, too funny. Uh, and then they, they kind of taunt me. Um, and, and then the rest of the show is downhill from there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Also, I've just, I've just been so tired, because I've been doing all these extra shows, and I've had to... I've had a couple of other like bits of you know private thumbs down uh, stuff going on, and um, one of these extra shows that I'm doing is in quite a big room called the Counting House Ballroom, and it is a former ballroom, and uh, the lighting is such that well, Bobby, you'll know this. So sometimes stage lighting means that you simply cannot see the audience at all. It's just bright lights in your face, and so it doesn't matter that there's a hundred or two hundred people because you just can't see them. And uh, I got to about fifty minutes through my show, and I took a step forward and I fell off the stage. 
I completely, I just took one really neat step and I collapsed in a ball on the floor. And of course, that was the funniest thing that happened during the show. And my closing joke couldn't have been funnier than that. Audience members were standing up trying to get a better look. <laughs> Someone heckled, are you okay? I said, obviously I'm not. Uh, so I'm mean, generally absolute set of disasters. But if anyone uh, here is, if anyone's listening to this, is in Edinburgh during the festival, um, we've added on a load of extra shows, so you'll definitely get tickets. Or if you just message me, I'll keep you a seat back. Uh, Wes, as a disaster mitigation expert, uh, I wish you could have been here three weeks ago before Ali started the French. Um, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you today, as a disaster mitigation expert and a special researcher into this topic, what does your research actually focus on and how did you get into this? That's a good question. And I like I I guess my office does more mitigation stuff than I do. I'm kind of a disaster recovery reconstruction person. Uh, mm -hmm. But I will tell you the brief version of this story. And it's a crazy story, which is like so many of us. I was an ALT in Japan and thought I'll do this for a few years and make money for grad school and go back and mm -hmm become a member of the bourgeoisie like I'm like jet program is supposed to launch me into and uh you know I was in Miyazaki for a while and like that go, that was going well and like you know you just kind of end up not going home when you thought you were going to and so I moved to to Kyoto and was working in Osaka being an ALT and that was fun and I was enjoying it and then I decided okay that's it I'm gonna join the navy I can't do this anymore so <laughs> it's not where you thought the story was going I tried to wow. I, I applied for grad school and I, applied, I tried to join the Navy at the same time. I was like, I'm just, I can't be an ALT anymore. I'm going to see how this works out. Roll the dice. Uh, and so I can't remember exactly the order that things happened, but the, the tsunami happened in uh, uh, March of 2011. And I had just gotten married a little bit before that. Um, my wife was pregnant. And uh, so the tsunami happened. And I found out I got into Tulane for grad school at the same time. It's like, well, this is weird. And so what happened was I was doing photography for like local MMA events then, like underground MMA okay, stuff in Osaka. Another weird tangent. Yeah, right? weird. It's all, it's all, yeah. And so my friend that had been uh, a jet as well was a pretty big time photographer. And we got in contact with each other. And he's like, look, they need people for, to work on the tsunami as a photographer. They need people to speak Japanese and English. I can get you hooked up with that if you can go do it. I'm like, okay, I feel like I need to go. Like so many people who are here, it's like, I need to go do something. Like this is weird sitting here through this. So I got this gig being a photojournalist through the tsunami, and I went up there at the time knowing that I'd just gotten into Tulane for, for architecture school, and like, so I went in, in, up there, and I was like, well, this, I can't, like, not work on this anymore. Once I went up there, I'm like, this is too huge a deal to, like, walk away from. I'm interested in it. I'm invested in it now. So when I went back to go to, to grad school, I was like, well, I'm going to study disasters. And so after getting my master's, I thought, well, I still don't quite understand what's going on. I'm going to try to work on a PhD and understand this. I'd never been interested in sociology, didn't know anything about sociology, but it looked like that was kind of one way to try to understand what was going on in a way that architecture wasn't really helping me understand it. So I walked backwards into getting a, a PhD in sociology, and I studied the um, recovery in a small town called Minami Sanriku in Miyagi Prefecture. Yeah, we actually, we had a... A guest, Angela, uh, came on a while back. Um, she wrote a book. She did a lot of work in Minami Sanriku as well. Really? She wrote a book? Do I know her? Uh, Angela Ortiz, oh. I think. Oh, she, she um, did the volunteer group, right? She's a, she was like headed yeah, up yeah. a volunteer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's weird. I've never met her, and I feel like we've probably like been in the same building like often, and I never, I never end up meeting her. I, I know about her. I know people who know her. But well, we can use the JBRC alumni network as long right. as you wear the right tie <laughs> yeah. and turn up to the right drinks event. We'll make sure to connect you. Yeah. Do you guys have a clubhouse somewhere? It's like a boat house. Out in with our... A boat house, as you should. A boat house. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it's very good we mentioned this, and I am getting better at doing this each week this segue that we are actually collecting money for a boat every single week some brian's pay us money uh, in order to fund a boat and latterly also potentially get some bonus content when i make it um, and so on that basis uh, we need to say thank you to a brand new brian who has signed up uh, who is a very special brian we need to say thank you to at milk is protein uh, who said <laughs> I've been greatly enjoying my Rent and Ollie trial. So switching to a full-time subscription was a no-brainer. This is brilliant. Yeah, you've somehow convinced somebody who's letting you stay in their apartment to pay you. Thank you. <laughs> 
And also, he, I mean, he's had a really rough deal because I'm getting back at like 2 a.m. after shows and I'm coming back like sneezing. And obviously, like, if I'm not bringing COVID, I'm bringing something else nasty into his house. Uh, and he's been nothing but nice, uh, you know, waking me up in the morning with smoothies and things. Uh, so not only have I got a sweet deal, uh, hopefully he's now got a sweet deal too because I'm going to give him a sticker. I think that's a fair enough trade. I'll, I'll send him a whole a full merch pack. Yeah, as an absolute minimum. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, thank you very much, Tom, for, for joining the membership. You absolutely didn't need to. Uh, thank you to all the other Brians uh, who continue to pay uh, the monthly membership to support the show. We do genuinely appreciate it, uh, and we're very glad uh, to have you on board. And thank him for that milk advice as well. <laughs> right, and with that, Bobby, shall we jump into the news? Bobby Judo, what's in the news this week? It is a great week to have Wes here. Wes uh, mentioned that he specializes in disaster reconstruction and recovery research, and there are areas of Japan right now that are currently in need of recovery and reconstruction after torrential rain has been drenching all of southwestern Japan, flooding many areas that were flooded last year, and we're already in the process of recovery from that. Uh, Wes, have you been following the news about the weather? I not only been following it, I was trapped in it for a while. I was in Kagoshima uh, for two weeks with my, my wife's family. Uh, we were trying to hide from um, COVID in Kagoshima and found rain. So we we're stuck in that. And that, seriously, even as a lifelong resident of the Gulf Coast in, in America and someone who's lived in Japan for a while, like that's the most rain I've ever seen in my life. It was insane. Can you describe the rain for someone that I obviously have not been there? And I, like, I think I know what heavy rain is from the UK, but my friends have described this as absolutely like nothing they've ever seen before it, well, it's historically unprecedented yes i was about to start describing rain for you but then i realized it wasn't an actual comedy setup you're actually asking what the rain was. <laughs> no it was just constant it was constant it was like during the rainy season you know you get rain and it's constant but this was just hard rain and it wasn't windy like a typhoon most of the time although it did get a little bit windy it was just pouring constantly pouring pouring yeah. pouring it was so heavy like i would wake up in the middle of the night to, to the rain we had to, you know, shut the windows and stuff. And it was just this hard, heavy rain that just wouldn't stop. Um, and everywhere you went outside, it was anything other than a flat surface. It was just running water. So this rain is like pointless having an umbrella level of rain. Like, can't leave the house, you know, completely you could, trapped like, indoors. You could, like, you could wear it, go out with an umbrella, but it was just heavy, heavy rain. And the main thing about it was it wasn't just all day. It was the next day and the yeah. next day and the next it day. Was it was the yeah, volume. from Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night through like this Monday, Sunday mm -hmm. afternoon, maybe it was just constant, constant rain. One of the stats that I saw for Fukuoka um, was that three times the amount of rain that usually falls in the month of August fell right. in those two days. And that's still going on in some locations right now for other prefectures, too. It's been the same. It, another one I saw it was like... Uh, it was even a level like above that where it was like in two days they got like you know four times the usual mm -hmm. amount for a month so yeah it's just the the amount that you're you keep feeling like something's gonna give like this is too much rain for this to be possible and this is happening in places where the exact same thing happened last year or two years ago and it happened so bad that that you know because the terrain there is mountainous or because they're close to rivers that when a river overflows it destroys cars it destroys buildings it destroys houses on the mountain slopes there are landslides that you get these huge mudslides that tear houses apart and bury villages completely yeah, and that was one of the scary things about being in Kagoshima, because uh, as you probably know, being in Kyushu, like Kagoshima has all the volcanic soil, Shirasu soil, so it's like this really loose, and when it breaks, it just goes. They get huge landslides down there, and my wife's family's house is kind of like at the bottom of a mountain, like next to a river. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man, I kept waking up all night thinking, is this thing going to let loose? I hope not. But yeah, I mean, it's part of the, geog the topography of Japan, right? You have mountains that go straight down into the sea, pretty much. And what area of flatland there is, is the only arable land. It's either, you know, uh, rice fields or, or, or housing. And so there's not mm. that much place that's not under a threat of landslide or flooding at some point. So knowing that this is bound to happen, what are the preventative measures that are put in place? This is that's interesting because, like, if you kind of think of the, the Alex Kerr, Dogs and Demons reading of Japan that so many of us do, me, me too. Uh, I, I don't know what that is. You don't? Okay, so Alex Kerr, he's a Kyoto resident. He's lived in Japan like a while. He's wrote the book Dogs and Demons. 
it's kind of a downer on Japan, but I think it's one of those things like kind of like jets when I was on jet, like pass it around to depress each other. It's like one, once you come to Japan, like what a cool country. I love this. Everything's great. And you read it. You're like, oh, my God, it actually kind of sucks, too. Um, it's one of those downer books. And he talks a lot in about how so much of Japan has been concreted over and tetrapotted and mm-hmm. all that stuff that we, we see go on. Uh, and a lot of that stuff, all of that stuff is written down as preventative measures, right? And that to some extent is true, right? Like you do, like you do see some of the benefit of that when, when this happens, you're kind of glad to have a big giant levee between you and the river. You're kind of glad that the, the mountainside above you is like concreted over and chained in with these huge cables. But you know, the other side of that is, well, what if you'd never developed it in the first place and maybe you wouldn't have to be worrying all of about all of this downstream and you know we know from a lot of rivers that that the flooding downstream is also a product of the concreting upstream so it gets really complex to say what are the preventative measures and and what aren't if i if i take zoom out really far the preventative measures are stop doing development but that's that's the the way zoomed out well one of the issues with the preventative measures that are already in place is that it's based on a climate that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there's been so many changes in weather patterns and severity of weather phenomenon that you, we, Ollie and I have been joking about this for the last two years that we've been doing this show that every year they say, you know, a once in a hundred year weather events. And you can't keep saying that every year if it happens every year. And this time on the TV, they didn't even do that. They just went, this has never happened before. This is happening yeah, in areas that have never seen this. Yeah, there were so many interesting news headlines. There was the one I remarked on on Twitter, which was it was like the Doko Demo Saiga no Kano ga Otter. There's a possibility for disaster. It was like, yeah, that's true. There is possibility of disaster everywhere. That's, that's accurate. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the once in a hundred years thing because it's one of my favorite like things that hammer on. Do you know like what that's based on? Like, do you as like a, someone who doesn't do this? kind of thing for a living know what the one in a hundred year standard is wouldn't it be so badass if we did no because it's ridiculous <laughs> if we knew something for once in a while yeah it's a really bad <laughs> metric it means like it doesn't mean once in every 100 years it means each year there's a one in a hundred chance there's a one percent chance of this event happening hang on what but what does a one percent chance mean it means if that year happened a hundred times one of those years it would happen or it could happen in eight successive years and you know you know okay. you know the percent like that's one thing people are so bad at understanding like percentages and and how these things happen and and, right. and so it's a horrible horrible metric that we give people for gauging these things i'm glad to see people move away from it so what should we use what should we use well as bobby was saying is the correct point is like even that's even if that scale was accurate we should stop using it because that's one in a hundred years based on what we knew up until now and we know that every year after now isn't going to be that way so what we should be using is uh, is what the dire predictions are for what our future world is going to look like, right? And I would say, you know, don't be don't be doom and gloomers, but start examining what the worst case scenarios are going to be and think about about planning for those, right? Because as you said, like this rain, it's never happened before. But guess what? It's it's not going to be the last time it happens. So when we're planning for disasters, are there kind of two things at work? One is the chance of it happening. And then the second is when it happens, how bad is it going to be? And and I imagine that those levers can be pulled in so many different directions that it might be really hard to go. Well, yeah, there's there's a chance that this part of the country might be under six foot of water, but the chance is so low we're not going to bother preparing at all. Or if we do prepare, we're just going to prepare such that people can, can grab their stuff but not die. Or like, how, how do you even begin to, to quantify loss of life or loss of quality of life or mm-hmm. loss of revenue? What's the starting point for deciding this is where we're going to spend our resources because this is what we think is going to have the greatest amount of impact? That's a really good question. And I guess, did, did either of you read, uh, was it Black Swan was a really popular airport book a while back about like... You yeah. have got to stop asking us if we've read, if we've okay. read stuff. The answer would right. inevitably be no. Uh, I actually, I actually yeah, met ever... Alex Kerr. I interviewed him for, for a TV show a while back and we actually oh, invited really? him to be on this show when he was stuck in Thailand and he couldn't make it. But I was not uh, familiar with Demon Days. Um, I should Demon. read that before he... It's good. The Demon it's Days good. is it's a good. Gorillas album. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It's a good album. You could listen to that and read Dogs and Demons. Hey, Wes, fat. you can ask us any question about 90s pop and we'll be all over it. But any, 90s any pop. Any work of literature. Okay, I'll, we'll get to that in the after show. I have lots of questions about 90s pop. <laughs> but um, what was my answer for you? Oh, yeah. Well, the, the thing, how do you begin? That's one of the things. So in like the, the idea of a black swan, like a long tail event, is that there's not much chance of it happening 
But if it does, it's really bad, right? And so you should plan on it. But here's the thing, like people like me don't get to make any of these decisions. The people who do are politicians and politicians tend to gamble on the idea that these things will not happen while they're in office, right? And, and that's a right. decent gamble or was a decent gamble to take. So um, I think it was Bill Clinton kind of lucked out. He had eight years, talking about American presidents, but he kind of lucked out where there's eight years where nothing really crazy happened disaster wise, right? I bet there was a brief period where Bill Clinton kind of wished some disaster would happen. Probably, probably. He, he made yeah. some. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the politicians kind of gamble this is not going to happen to them. And then the other side of that is when it does happen, it's usually politicians' first time encountering these things, right? And so that's one of the, the reasons they frame them as, ah, oh, it's, it's a disaster. Who could have seen it coming? We never knew. How can this happen? How could this happen to us? And so the, I guess the real answer is, is that for us as disaster researchers, we're generally like kind of worst case scenario people. We're like, all of this is horrible. Look what's going to happen. My hair is constantly on fire, which is why I have all these mm. hard hats in the background. But like, you know, politicians have to be the other way because you're not going to win many elections on, uh, let's think about this disaster that might happen. You're going to win on, we're going to build this. We're going to do this. We're going to cut your taxes on this. You're gonna, right? And so all of that stuff is up front. And then when a disaster happens, you say, I couldn't have seen it coming. Now that's a little different these days, I think, and especially in talking about Japan, I feel it's a little different in Japan, where there's a certain expectation by the public that, that dealing with disasters is the government's business, and that mm. it's really something that you need to stay on top of. And right. you know, we saw the last time that LDP wasn't in power was was on uh, 311, and um, and you know, Khan was out of power very quickly because of, of the situation, right? So it does it does matter in that. So. I mean, I guess your question is, how do you deal with balancing the everyday versus the big scale thing? And um, I don't know. I think of it as kind of kind of uh, a, co a constant across yeah, all of that. And also, I suppose, digging a bit deeper, if you were to say, right, look, there's a very, very small chance. Mm -hmm. But if it were to happen, it's going to be awful disaster. And like that could be anything, right? right? Flooding or volcano or whatever. Nuclear right? reactor. Right. Is there a point at which you say, well, there's no point in putting any effort in because we're only ever going to be able to take a thimble to bail the water out of this boat? So do you, are there some uh, issues where you say, well, we're just going to have to accept regrettably that a load of people are going to lose their lives because no matter how much effort we put in, we're never going to be able to compete with Mother Nature. Well, strangely, that's that's kind of the default position of politics, I think, or especially in America, where it's like, uh, you know, it's been the position of conservative parties that, well, climate change isn't a thing. Okay, well, climate change isn't a thing, uh, is a thing, but people didn't do it. And then, okay, people mm. did it, but now what's the point of dealing with it? Like, it's here. Like, it would be too much of a hit on our economy to do anything about it. So why don't we just, like, see what happens and people will adjust, right? So I think that's kind of the default position of of a lot of people who aren't in my work. I think people who work on disasters, who've seen what, what it's like, um, say, look, well, we gotta, we gotta do what we can to make sure this doesn't happen. We have like the base level responsibility to human beings is to make sure they don't have to suffer through this stuff. Uh, let, let's see what we can do about it. Um, I think the problem is that gets in conflict with our, you know, econ our political economies and our political structures and all these things above it, where they don't want to be pushed off of doing what they're doing that creates the everyday world that we live in. And so um, their answer is, well, what if we just do nothing and see what happens? Well, I think that attitude kind of permeates the public's opinion at large as well, because um, all of these stories that we're seeing on the news and that we're seeing online are, they're full, they're chock full of quotes from people who've been victimized by these disasters going, there's nothing to be done. You know, we can't really move. I guess I'll have to rebuild my house taller. I mean, this happened last year. I hope it doesn't happen again next year, but what are you going to do? Yeah, I saw, I remember last year, somebody in the flooding last year had lost their home and business in the tsunami in 2011 and then got flooded out in the rain last year after they just rebuilt a house. And it's like, what, you know, uh, what do you keep asking from people? Just, well, I guess be resilient. Uh, we'll do some sustainability and you be resilient and we'll hope it works out for you, right? And then, you know, we've seen people with the Houston flooding in America last year. There are people who were finally questioning. They were like, I don't know if we can live here anymore. I don't know if it's, yeah. if it's something that we can do to keep living here. Well, I mean, in terms of the climate crisis and the way the water levels are going to rise, I mean, Japan has so many coastal residential areas that they'll have mm -hmm. to 
reevaluate or look into what I, I know there are already places in the US that are looking into ways of um, elevating the ground on, along the coast <laughs> and they're doing like a triage they're, they're doing triage to say you know this is the place that we let go and this is the place that we build up so Wes, our question is at yeah. one point do we say we're giving up uh, personally or like as a society because personally I gave up a long a long time ago. I don't want to um, ask that question. I want to ask. Um, that is kind of what you're asking, though. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be positive, and I, let's let's frame this a slightly different way. Okay. Which areas of the world do we not give up on? How's that? <laughs> In a country <laughs> where foreigners who are here already kind of focus on this idea that Japan uses shogunai as an excuse too much to not oh, yes. take action. How do you yes. break that shogunai, shikataganai? What's the messaging that that needs to be out there? to get people to think about policy changes around disaster prevention or mitigation. Mm, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but the good thing in Japan is I think people are kind of invested. Like it's kind of a, it's weird to me because I, I enjoy being critical. I like being critical of the government. I, I'm not a big fan of the controlling party of Japan. But they, there are, I think, the government, this idea of bullseye, right? Like, it's everywhere. My fourth grader brings home his, like, bullseye project. Like, I go to talk to his class about bullseye, like, disaster prevention. Yeah. In, I think, I think Japan is a country is really... It's one of my really... few remaining TV jobs these days. I do a show called Bullseye for NHK World. Oh, really? <laughs> You're the bullseye yeah. guy? Oh, I'm one of them. Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, and so Japan has really worked on selling this idea, too, that Japan knows both sides. Japan does both sides. Like, we're, we're good at both sides. And it's true to a certain extent. And so I don't think you have to, like, penetrate a wall in Japan to get people to think this stuff's important. I think they do. I think the harder part is relating it to our everyday political economy and how that keeps furthering uh, our disasters. Part of the problem is the Japanese language, too. We have this in English, too, where disasters are called natural disasters. In Japan, they're... Uh, She's inside guy, right? Like, and so yeah. it's the hard part is detaching that part of it and saying, no, it's not natural. It's stuff that we're doing and we need to reconsider that. So like it's one thing to add. And I got in big trouble, as I often do on Twitter for saying this a few months ago. Like we ask people, like, make your bullseye bag and keep it in your house. But we don't your, say like, your go bag for when a your disaster bag, happens. Yeah, That's get, your, you know, your bullseye bag. stuff. But we don't so much say like, all right, uh, Toyota, you need to cut back your emissions like by severely, right? We need to uh, move away from having an economy that produces like that is that it constantly needs the GDP to grow, right? We need to stop having news reports about how whether the GDP is going to grow or not and stop measuring our yeah. society that way. That's harder, right? One of my favorite posts uh, that I saw when that Gulf of oil, that Gulf of Mexico oil leak happened, and there was that mm -hmm. burning vortex of flame in the middle of the ocean. That and all the boats were trying to put out somebody <laughs> tweeted that yeah. one with if i recycle enough cans i can stop right this. right right yeah i felt really bad i do this to my kid a lot like he's doing all the bullseye size stuff at school and going to the the, the clean i was sorry, it's clean center the green center wherever they do all the recycling and i was kind of like uh you know uh, that doesn't really do anything you know that's really <laughs> you're not really gonna change and like he's like what are you talking about like we have to recycle our garbage i'm like oh, that's good that's there's nothing wrong with recycling your garbage but like it's going to take a lot more than, than people recycling their garbage to fix this stuff. But like, you know, the entry points there, if you say, okay, you care about not having disasters. I believe you, like you do care. So like, but here's what it's going to take. It's going to take, um, you know, building a seawall is not going to cover it at some point, right? It's going to be changing fundamentally what we do as a society. And that's hard. That's the hard part. So, Wes, if the weather is going to continue worsening and we're going to start to see these kinds of rainfalls and these kinds of events every year, then realistically speaking, what does the future look like for Japan? And does your job title change from disaster preparation to just contemporary observer of chaos? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. op-ed columnist. Um, <laughs> A chronicler. Uh, what does it look like for Japan? Well, so Japan prides itself on being really prepared mm. for this stuff. And as I often note to people, a lot of that is that Japan's the number three economy in the world. So that kind of makes it easier to prepare, right? So <clears throat> I think Japan is situated fairly okay for this stuff. Like, and I don't mean to sound great, but fairly okay. But then what is the world that changes around Japan? Like what are Japan's obligations to that world of being the third largest economy and things like that? So I'm not saying there won't be crisis in Japan. It won't be suffering in Japan, suffering in Japan, but I think it's better positioned than other places. Right. But I think then 
the questions become like, what is the what does the world look like? What does the world order look like? What is Japan's role in that system of production? Right? Like, is Japan going to be able to con continue a robust consumer capitalist culture for years and years and years into the future, and also be concerned about the climate crisis? That I think that would be the big question. So then we do have a really really daunting task ahead of us because it looks like to best help Japan prepare to mitigate the disasters in the mm -hmm. future, we're going to have to convince them to start getting along with China. Yeah, well, at least you don't have to convince them to get along with Korea. Hey, thanks very much for listening to this episode 96 of Japan by River Cruise. If you are an existing listener of the show, please don't forget to leave us a review wherever you're listening to the show. And if you're new, please subscribe. We have a new episode most Fridays. And if you're a non-existing listener of the show, then you don't exist. Um, thank you to our guest this week, Wes. It was a pleasure talking to you. And we hope to have you back someday. Yeah, and I talk to you guys. I hope you have me back when the next disaster happens. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you guys next week as well.